Support for this podcast and the following message come from Money Mind from Prudential, a podcast powered by your financial behavior. Hear insights from financial psychologists, experts, and more. Download and subscribe to Money Mind wherever you find podcasts and learn more at slate.com slash money mind. Hey, take Ask Me Another and more with you with the NPR One app. NPR One finds you the best from public radio and beyond. Election essentials, local stories, and your favorite podcasts. NPR One is ready to make a trip, waiting in line, or waiting for a friend so much better. Find NPR O-N-E in your app store now. And if you're working on your intern application, good news, the deadline has been extended to Sunday, November 6th. So just go to npr.org slash internship to apply. From NPR and WNYC, this is Ask Me Another. I'm Ophira Eisenberg, and I'm here in studio with house musician Jonathan Colton, because this week we're dedicating an hour to a special theme, TV. TV on the radio. That's right. It's our first and only television show on the radio. It's about time, I'd say. We're going to be revisiting some of our favorite games about television, and we're going to be playing a brand new game with one lucky phone contestant. Jonathan, is there a show that you wish had its own spinoff, like The Walking Dead has Fear of the Walking Dead? Yeah, I feel like when they did a spinoff of Walking Dead, they missed a great opportunity. Oh, yeah? Well, what they should have done is done a spinoff where it's just about one of the zombies. The life of the zombie? The life of the zombie. is just his day-to-day life. You follow him around. He's kind of shuffling for maybe <laughs> 20 minutes in the show, and he hears a noise, and he goes. He checks it out. It's nothing. But sometimes it's a person. Walking Dead Miami. <laughs> Walking Dead SVU. Walking Dead Las Vegas. <laughs> oh, brilliant. So in this game, we play a word game in which we create television show spin-offs. Let's see how well contestants Carmine Giovino and Annie Brogan do in this game. Puzzle guru John Chinesky, please give us an example. Sheriff Rick Grimes thought that zombies in America were tough, but now he's fighting meat puppets on a lake in the Middle East that's got so much salt in it, the zombies float. That would be a summary for... The Walking Dead Sea. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so it's a, awesome. it's a bit of a mashup, a bit of a pun. Right. It will always start with the name of an actual television show with some extra stuff jammed onto the end. <laughs> Elegantly. Are you ready? Let's do it. Let's okay. Do it. Down on their luck, the Dunphys and the Pritchetts go on a popular game show and suddenly find themselves undefeated champions. Will their hilarious answers to survey questions ever end? Annie. Modern Family Feud. You got it. In this prequel spinoff, we discover the real reason Walter White started his meth empire. Years of exposure to chemicals gave him chronic halitosis. Annie. Breaking Bad Breath. That's right. <laughs> Sort of a limited idea for a series. But. I love it. It's like, who cares about your breath when you have meth teeth, I guess. <laughs> they, uh... <laughs> your breath is sort of the least of your worries. Yeah, exactly. To make up for a series finale that was hated by its fans, Ted Mosby and Robin begin telling the kids the story of how they purchased a liberal political magazine and launched a media empire. Annie. How I Met Your Mother Jones. Nice. People are impressed by that. <laughs> They're like, oh, that Whoa. sounds like a show I would like. <laughs> Upon regenerating for the 12th time, our title character's TARDIS, that's a hint, is pulled to New York City, where he is challenged to answer increasingly difficult multiple-choice questions to win a life-changing amount of money. Oh, Carmine, you don't know? You're just giving it to yes. Annie? Okay. Carmine is like, go ahead, Annie. <laughs> Uh, Doctor Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? That's right. <laughs> this was my biggest fear. <laughs> Not just about this show in general. This was my biggest fear. <laughs> in, your, in your life. Yeah. When Peter Griffin leaves this animated show to pursue other opportunities, he is replaced by a British director whose ex-wife, Madonna, makes frequent appearances in cutaway gags. Yes! Carmine! <laughs> Great job, Carmine. 
I don't want to screw this up now. Family Guy Richie. That's right. I'm on the board. That's Carmine, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Buzzer number two. <laughs> to make peace with their human counterparts, the vampires of Bonton form a medical supply company and embark on a noble challenge to create a device that makes the most accurate systolic and diastolic measurements ever. Carmine. True blood drive? True blood machine? <laughs> no, those are both wrong. <laughs> An Annie, do you have a guess? I do, and it's only because he said true blood, so thank you. You're welcome. Do I get half a point? It's Story a, of your life, Carmine. Uh, true blood pressure gauge? Just true blood pressure would have done. Oh, okay. Wait, wait, wait. It's where you go if you are feeling twilight headed. Huh. Uh, wow. Come on. Wow, that's pretty good. No. That's pretty good. All right, this is your last question. In the season finale, Frank Underwood attempts to undermine his opponent's chances at winning the presidency by filming him playing an offensive fill in the blank party game with wealthy donors. Carmine. House of Cards Against Humanity? That's right. John Chinesky, how did our contestants do? Well, he made a big push at the end, but I'm afraid our winner today of spinoffs is Annie. Way to go, Annie. The sad thing about all TV shows is that they have to end sometime. Except, of course, for The Simpsons. That show is going to outlast us all. But the best thing a TV show creator can hope for is that you know when the end is coming and you can write a fitting last episode. Sometimes that episode is amazing, like Don Draper sitting on the top of a mountain. Whoa. Oh, sorry. That's a spoiler. Spoiler. And other times the ending gets a little weird. So in this game, we quiz James Gallen and Adar Eisenbrook on series finales that were a little controversial. You ready? The family matriarch sits with her typewriter in the basement. A voiceover tells us that she never won the lottery. It was just a fantasy. Worse, we find out that Dan has been dead for the entire last season. Mrs. Connor curls up on a ratty couch turns on the TV as a quote from Lawrence of Arabia flashes on the screen. James. Roseanne. That is correct, Roseanne. It was a weird one. Oh, I love Roseanne. That was like the best show growing up. I wasn't allowed to watch it because I was too little, but I used to see it. And they thought you in. would be influenced by that show in a bad way? Uh, you know, working class. I, I don't think it was like a bad thing. <laughs> You don't want to show you kids a lot of working class stuff. Yeah, we just yeah. watched Dynasty and went, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Aspirational television. People who work nine to five jobs are beneath you, James. <laughs> Did you grow up really rich, James? No, and I'm unemployed now. Okay. So. <laughs> so. Our leading man takes his sister off life support and dumps her body in the ocean. Days later, we find out that he is dead, too fade to black. But wait! Suddenly we're in the Pacific Northwest, where our hero is hiding out, working as a truck driver. His beard is longer, and he's wearing flannel. James. Dexter. Dexter is correct. I love a disguise where your beard is just longer. Right. I'm, we I'm wearing that right now. Yeah, you're wearing it, yeah. Our protagonist walks down a busy New York street in the same fur coat she wore in the series premiere. Her pink cell phone rings, she checks the caller ID, and finally, we learn that Mr. Big's real first name is, wait for it, John. James. Sex in the City. Sex in the City, yep. My wife watched that movie every day for like a year. Oh. The one, not two. Yeah, thank, thank you, you yeah. thank you. She has standards. Yeah, that is, thank goodness. No working class people in it either, so both... <laughs> Both spouses Still are happy. Safe, Still safe okay. to watch. The citizens of Walnut Grove, Minnesota, discover that their small town has been purchased by a rich robber baron. In a bizarre attempt to preserve their dignity, Laura and the townsfolk elect to blow up their own homes. We watch everything explode. I remember watching this. It was weird. Twin Peaks? <laughs> It's a, it's a fine guess, but it's incorrect. Yeah. Adar, do you know the answer? There is a chance that I misrepresented my skill set during the application <laughs> process. <laughs> I, 
I don't know the answer. I have never watched television. I do not know what television yeah. is. Not a day goes by that I don't think the same thing. <laughs> I know. Do you watch a lot of television? Well, I thought I did, but yeah. apparently <laughs> not nearly enough. You're wasting all your time in grad school. Yeah. You gotta be unemployed like James. Right. You have plenty of time for television. Yeah. <laughs> the answer we were looking for was Little House on the Prairie. Yeah. It's a bizarre way to end that series. We're in present day New York City. Everyone's married to or about to get married to their high school sweetheart. After six years of guessing, we finally find out which character Kristen Bell was performing her voiceover for. And it was a guy. James. Gossip girl. <laughs> yes, indeed. Wow. I don't feel bad that he got it. <laughs> I feel bad that I got it. This children's series ends with Earl Sinclair gathering his family in the living room. He tells his children that his attempts to tamper with nature have set about the end of the world. What's going to happen to us, his adorable baby asks. The snow outside the window answers the question. Global cooling has doomed their entire species. James. Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. Are you kidding me? I have nothing to do. Who knew that Gossip Girl and Dinosaurs was reaching the same demographic? <laughs> You're breaking all the models, James. It's fantastic. I'm a renaissance man. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to give you a job right now, James. Will you watch television for me? I will. Yeah, you could do coverage or something at the very something, least. Yeah. Scheduling. Maybe scheduling would be good for you because you're like, 8 a.m. I watch dinosaurs. <laughs> I don't get up until noon. <laughs> you're not, not selling us. Yeah, you're just bragging now, really. All right, we're in church. Nearly all of the show's main characters, including deceased ones, hug and exchange meaningful looks, but no one says a word. Cut to the bamboo forest, where our bleeding protagonist is taking his final breath. Now we're back in church, as blinding light swallows the scene, the last shot, Jack's eye closes. Sorry, James? lost. Lost is correct, yes. Puzzle guru Will Hines. I mean, in the realms of honesty, they were both winners. But Thank you. in terms of knowing maybe an unflattering amount about the end of a lot of television series, James was the clear winner. So, uh, James, well done. You're moving on to the final round. Coming up after the break, we get comfortable with someone who really does have the dream job of getting paid to watch television. I'm talking New Yorker television columnist Emily Nussbaum. And indie rock band They Might Be Giants joins Jonathan Colton in reviving some classic TV themes. I'm Ophira Eisberg, and this is Ask Me Another from NPR. Just a quick shout out to our sponsor who brings you this message, Zip Recruiter. They understand that posting your job in one place isn't enough to find quality candidates. If you want to find the perfect hire, you need to post your job on all of the top job sites. And now you can. With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post your job to 100 plus job sites, including social media networks like Facebook and Twitter, all with a single click. Right now, Ask Me Another listeners can post jobs on Zip ZipRecruiter for free by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash another. Thanks so much for listening to Ask Me Another, and you should check out NPR's Bullseye with Jesse Thorne, your guide to what's good in pop culture. And every week, Jesse Thorne interviews people like Cameron Esposito, Rashida Jones, and Felicity Huffman about their creative work and lives. So find your new favorite TV shows, books, movies, and music, plus gain insights into the things you already love. Find Bullseye now on the NPR One app and at npr.org slash podcasts. You're listening to Ask Me Another from NPR and WNYC. I'm Ophira Eisenberg, and I'm here in studio with our house musician, Jonathan Colton, for a very special TV on the radio episode. You know what I miss about television? 
What is that? I miss television theme songs. You know, they had the lyrics that explain the entire show, uh, what the whole show was about. Like, think about Gilligan's Island or the Brady Bunch. It was like cliff notes. Yeah, it fills you in on everything that's happening in the show. I love that. Right. So in this next game, the band They Might Be Giants helped me update some classic theme songs. We rewrote their lyrics to be about more modern TV dramas and asked contestants Rachel Lang and Navdeep Tucker to identify both shows. And we learned something. We learned that while classic theme songs are very catchy, nobody under the age of 40 remembers what television shows they were for. Yeah. Oh, well. Take a listen. So, you see, you have to tell us what the drama is that we are describing with the lyrics. And for a bonus point, tell us what sitcom the theme song was originally from. And if you get either part incorrect, your opponent can steal that point. Are you ready? Yes. Yes. Okay. Just sit right back in your chip and tail with a wealthy family. They live in a Yorkshire mansion in highbrow society. The Earl, he is unflappable. The Dowager's so strong. Aristocrats and servants, can they really get along? Can they really get along? Rachel. Downton Abbey is the drama. Yes. And um, the song is, oh my God. Wait, all, all, all I can think of is... All, it's okay, it's okay it, relax. They're just it. young, everybody. They're just young. It's not their fault. I agree with you. It is shocking. Enough deep, do you know the answer? That would be Gilligan's Island. Yes. Nice. You are both correct. Making your way in D.C. today, there's no room for disgrace. Hire yourself a crisis manager, maybe you'll save face. Has your public image gone astray? Sometimes you need to know somebody who can clear your name. She'll find someone else to blame. She's got problems of her own. Her wardrobe is never tame. She'll always be somebody who can clear your name. Rachel. Scandal is the drama. Uh huh. Thank God. I just want to say that, Ophira, you look a lot like Olivia Pope right now, and I'm loving it. You won the game. Thank you. Um, and the show is uh, Cheers. You got it. Yeah. Right. Meet Dana, the one who stays detached. Remained a skeptic till Fox was snatched. But Fox believes conspiracies and cover-ups occur with ease. They might seem mismatched, but they're partners. They're FBI partners, and you'll find. When paranormal things they sleuth, they both are searching for the truth. They become aligned when partners find threats to mankind. Rachel. It's the X-Files, and I don't know what the other thing is. <laughs> You sound so sad. Don't feel sad. Well, You're young. I'm disappointed Your in whole myself. life is in front of you. <laughs> you have so much potential. X-Files is correct. Now, do, you, do you want to steal the, the second point? There's some sort of relative. I, I know that. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's right. That's right. <laughs> There's some sort of relative. Some okay, sort of relative. Yeah, they're, they're related in some manner. Related Unusual in some manner. relatives. <laughs> uh, what, what is it? Everyone knows what it is, right? It's the Patty Duke Show. They were cousins, identical cousins, which I don't think is a thing. No, it's not. All right, here we go. Baby, if you've ever wondered, wondered whatever came of me. I'm living in New York, I'm in the ad game. Now I have a new identity. Got kind of tired of having no real future. Ditched the war, left poverty behind Living the ideal mid-century lifestyle But nothing really seems to ease my mind I'm living in New York City And I've got a fake name Rachel Mad Men Uh-huh 
And? I, you think, I mean, I think. Yeah, you're just going to pass. <laughs> Don't even try. No. Don't even try. Navdeep, do you know what the original sitcom was? They know. They know. They know. No, I know. They but know. they're not up here on stage. It's hard, for, it's hard for you guys. Is it Partridge Family? Dear God. Not Navdeep. even close. Not even close. No. What is it, everybody? WKRP in Cincinnati. WKRP in Cincinnati. It was a show about a radio station. Radio was a kind of... Uh, Uh, this is your last question. To make it extra climactic, we're going to have They Might Be Giants play this one. Now the drug war failed, and we see that every day. Institutions are corrupt, and it's always been this way. The cops are gangs, the men and the press. Now Stringer Bell is dead, but no one will confess, because it's Yes, it's Baltimore. Yes, it's Baltimore in Maryland. Yes, it is Baltimore in Maryland. Enough deep. Is it the wire? It is the wire. Yes. Well done. Any any idea? Some, but not Some. a whole idea. Not a whole idea. Okay. Not enough of an idea to offer an answer. You just described a sitcom, my friend. <laughs> Maybe that'll be my second career. Okay. Rachel, do you, do you have any idea what it is? No. No. Okay. <laughs> what is it, everybody? <laughs> Different strokes, that's right. Art, what happened in this game? <laughs> what happened? I just felt my mortality. That's one thing that happened. <laughs> uh, well, for fourth graders, they did pretty well. <laughs> but Rachel was our winner. Congratulations, Rachel. Great job. You know, listening to that game, it makes me think that it's true. The kids these days are missing out because they have all these instrumental theme songs. Yeah, There's no well, lyrics. I'm blaming you. It's your but, job. You owe it to America, Jonathan Colton, to solve this problem and write more TV theme lyrics. Listen, Ophira, I'm only one man, but I did do that, actually. Here's some lyrics that I wrote for I Dream of Jeannie. And when I wrote this, I didn't know there actually are lyrics to the song. But it doesn't matter because mine are better. Jeannie, she calls her boyfriend master. She can do magic when she crosses her arms and nods. She's a crazy genie and he's an astronaut. They get into trouble sometimes. And sometimes his boss can get suspicious Her double gets malicious Their friend's the only one who knows that her name is Jeannie She calls her boyfriend master She can do magic when she crosses her arms and nods Her arms and nods! So we've talked a lot about our favorite television shows so far, but we are the amateurs in this department. For The Real Scoop, we talk to an expert, New Yorker television columnist Emily Nussbaum. That's Pulitzer Prize-winning TV critic Emily Nussbaum to you. That's right. This year, our special guest won a Pulitzer for her essays in The New Yorker. And I think her appearance on Ask Me Another probably pushed her over the top for that award. You're welcome, Emily. In this clip, we talk to Emily about her current favorite shows. Then she helps lead a game using her award-winning reviews with help from puzzle guru John Chinesky. So what, what are you watching now that you're crazy about? Um, the Good Wife. Yes. Um, uh, let's see, Broad City I'm really into right now. Um, I'm, I came late to Adventure Time, but I just binge-watched Adventure Time, which is really fantastic. When you're reviewing a uh, new series, is there, do you have a specific standard that you hold them up to? Like this is the, the top of the pile that I will... It, I mean, it's hard to say. I just try to figure out whether I like it. It just sounds stupid. But <laughs> I mean, I don't have a particular mathematical algorithm for what I'm comparing it to. I mean, I do tend to favor things that are trying to do something new on TV, I hope. Um, even, and sometimes those are the shows that feel off-putting and disorienting, like Louie, or shows that do things that haven't been done previously so people don't know how to watch them. So I try to find those kinds of shows. But I, I've changed my mind about things a million times, so I don't trust my own judgment. No. <laughs> That's a good way to be for a critic. I like that. Do you would ever think I, I should write a series? Sure. You no? Do you think you should oh, write a series? I'm sorry, I oh, that's very nice. I thought, it, I thought you were asking whether you should write yeah, a series. I'd like to do one too. I'd like to do one too, actually. I want to write one. 
do you think I should write a series? <laughs> I'm like, okay, okay. I know. Since we have you here, here's my idea. So there's this girl. She hosts an NPR show. No. No, do you ever, because you have no. such knowledge. Yeah, I have no interest in writing a television show. All right, so here's my pitch. No. But you are very active on Twitter, and that uh, it kind of informs some of the stuff that you write for The New Yorker. Could you just talk a little bit about your yeah, I relationship? Love it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I find Twitter really fantastic for talking about television specifically, because I feel like, for one thing, it's a great way to procrastinate while I'm trapped at home and unable to write things. But then also, I feel like it gives me access globally to people who are excited about a lot of the same shows that I'm interested in, but see them from very different perspectives. I mean, there are people within The New Yorker who are interested in television, but there isn't a huge range of POVs in the same way. And there's this sense where I talk to people from other countries just, you know, occasionally I'll throw something out and just say, what should I be watching that I'm not watching? And I feel like I get all sorts of input. But also, I talk with other critics. It's a way of brainstorming. It's a way of goofing around and being funny. I, I feel more linked to other people watching. I mean, it makes TV into a social experience in a different way. So are you uh, often live tweeting during a show? I feel really ambivalent about it because I do occasionally do this, and I think it's a terrible thing to do. So I'm not sure how I feel about it. I mean, there are shows that I would never live tweet during that are very visual shows. But I have to admit that there are shows that are made for live tweeting, like Scandal particularly, is a show that, that that's the point of watching it to me. <laughs> it's like, it's a great, to have a conversation. Yeah, it's fun. I mean, it's like hooting in a movie theater or something. And so that one, it, not that I hoot in movie theaters, but <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, I mean, I haven't made up my mind about it. But it, it seems, it does seem a little bit troubling because it means that you're looking up and looking down and I try to focus. Right, and but some, when you were throwing things out, like I love this idea uh, that you were starting a conversation about a certain female archetype on television, and you were like, I need a name for this kind of spunky yet unsettling female character that, you know, and what, what should we call this person? And someone on Twitter, actually. Yeah, the hummingbird. Yes. I was talking about characters. I mean, and somebody suggested calling it the Diane Chambers because she was sort of the original the first hummingbird. one. Yeah, exactly. The sort of, I, I was excited about Enlightened, which if, I was, if it was on right now, I'd be evangelizing for it. But but unfortunately it was canceled. Um, but uh, that kind of um, tense but extremely idealistic female character who made people uncomfortable seemed to be on several different shows. And so, yeah, I brainstormed this name, and then I wrote this little mini-essay on it. Um, I was thinking of people like um, uh, Leslie Nope, um, a little bit Sue Hack on The Middle, which is another show I love. Um, I can't even remember what I was thinking because I was on Twitter, so it was right, that right. Story, it's a yeah, whole bunch of things. And then and someone, okay, awesome. We are going to put you in the puzzle hot seat just in a little while, uh, and we're going to talk about more of your uh, your beginnings in your television career, the show that started it all. But right now, you're going to help us out with our next game. So, hello, caller. You're on Ask Me Another. Hi, this is Ann Young in Oakland, California. And would you describe yourself as a uh, TV fanatic? Yes. Yes, yes, definitely. Okay, what, uh, what's something that you're watching right now that maybe you would be a little hesitant to tell a large group of people? Oh, um, oh gosh, Squidbillies? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what that is. <laughs> it's a ridiculous kind of adult swim show. It's animated and there's this, it's set in Georgia and it's, it's Hillbilly Squids. <laughs> Sort Pretty of much. writes itself. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like, I love Squid, uh, so I would watch that. Um, Emily, have you watched? I, I haven't, and I keep being told to watch more things on Adult Swim. Yeah. So that, that sounds great. That's amazing. <laughs> I did not know you were going to say that, Anne, or anything like that. And so thank you. Thank you for that. Oh, now, sure. I'm here with Emily Nussbaum, the television critic for The New Yorker, and this game is called Guilty Pleasures like the one we just found of yours. Uh, so we're going to have Emily read excerpts from her New Yorker reviews of recent television shows, and all you have to do is identify the show in each clue, and if you get enough questions correct, we are going to send you a prize. Oh, okay. Yeah? So Emily wrote this about a show that debuted in 2012. 
Popping with colorful villains, vote-rigging conspiracies, waterboarding assassinations, montages set to R&B songs, and the best gay couple on television, the president's chief of staff, Cyrus, and his husband, James, an investigative reporter, the series has become a giddy, paranoid fever dream, like 24 crossed with the West Wing lit up in neon pink. (laughs) Scandal! <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> Somehow you made that an eight syllable word. That was fantastic. I so I, I will admit I have not watched Scandal. Uh, oh. I know relax everybody. Oh my god, the letters we're gonna get. Uh, but I have friends who have become better friends because of their shared love of that show. It is you talk about this crazy addiction thing. That is a that is a prime example of it, right? Yeah. Just start binge watching, starting with season two. Starting with season two. That's where two? it really like jumps up. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I disagree. Oh. Oh. I mean, I'm not a critic or anything, but you know, I like the first season. The first season was trashier. I feel like trashier. <laughs> um, High standard. Um, yeah. <laughs> steamier. Steamier. All right. Here's your next clue. This sitcom is about a 30-something yuppie who is convinced that she's Sandra Bullock or Meg Ryan. Yet despite her insistence that she is gorgeous and sexy, a petite Asian woman, Dr. Lahiri is no catch out of central casting. She's pugnacious, she's self-centered, she's helplessly shallow. Yet she has the nerve to insist she's the star of her own story anyway. The Mindy Show. We'll take it. It's the Mindy Project. Very good. Oh, fair enough. Yeah, we'll clap for that. You can clap for that, yes. (laughs) In the fall of 2013, Emily wrote this. To my surprise, my favorite new network drama is a show that looked like the worst idea ever. It has sexy witches, four white birches that represent the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and dialogue like belief is sanity, Lieutenant. Sleepy Hollow. Yes. Nice. And you watch that? Yes, and I, that would also be a guilty pleasure, I would say. And the female star is dating Michael Fassbender, which I think about a lot when I'm watching it. It's a little jealous. <laughs> See, everyone has their own reason for enjoying a show. <laughs> All right, and this is your last question. Okay. In this HBO series, clever people take turns admiring one another. They sing arias of facts. They aim to remake TV news. This is a new show, and there are new rules, a Maverick executive producer announces several times in several ways. Their outrage is so inflamed that it amounts to a form of moral eczema, only it makes the viewer itch. Oh, burn. (laughs) What do you think, Ann? Is it the newsroom? Yes, it is. (laughs) Yes. Thank you, Ann. Thank you. Coming up, we'll put a phone contestant in the puzzle hot seat and see how much he knows about the casts of popular television shows. And later, we're forced to turn off the telly and go back to work to deal with our cranky bosses. So stay tuned. I'm Ophira Eisenberg, and this is Ask Me Another from NPR. Thanks to one of our sponsors, Rosetta Stone, who doesn't want to let the hustle and bustle of modern life stop you from learning another language. With on-the-go access, multi-device capability, fun bite-sized lessons, and more, Rosetta Stone is the affordable language program that makes learning another language easy. So you can save the puzzle solving for your favorite podcast. Get speaking right now and claim a special offer of 30% off Rosetta Stone by visiting rosettastone.com slash askme. You're listening to Ask Me Another from NPR and WNYC. I'm Ophira Eisenberg, and with me is house musician Jonathan Colton, and this week we're hitting the small screen. No, not your phone, your television. It is our special TV favorites episode, but the next game is not a rerun, no. We have a contestant on the line to play a brand new game. Hello, you're on Ask Me Another. Hi, this is Adam Kimmel from Chicago. Hello, Adam. How's Chicago? Oh, uh, it's uh, nicer than it was about a month ago. <laughs> I think people in Chicago say that every day. <laughs> now, you're a music journalist, but I love the fact that you once organized a charity event called Prom Hanks. 
Yeah, that's Tom true. Hanks. And everyone had to dress up as their favorite Tom Hanks movie character. Okay. Amazing idea. Which character did you dress as? I dressed as Sid, the psychotic uh, boy neighbor from Toy Story. Uh, I'm uh, six and a half feet tall, and my girlfriend at the time was rather short, so she dressed as Woody, and it made for uh, some pretty good psych acts. <laughs> was there anyone else dressed in the same costume? No. Luckily, that was wow. a bit of an obscure one. Yeah. Good, good. You're smart. You, you're unique. I'm sorry to hear that uh, it didn't work out with the short girlfriend. Well, you know, probably for the best. My back's a lot better now. All right. Your game is called First Name Basis. Now we all know Cheers is the bar where everyone knows your name. So in this game, we're going to give you the first names of four characters from a popular television show. And all you have to do is name the show. For example, if we give you Sam, Diane, Cliff, and Norm, you would say Cheers. And if you need a little help, we will give you a hint because we want everybody to be happy and win all the time. And just to remind you that the stakes are very high because if you do well enough... We're going to send you an Ask Me Another Rubik's Cube. Awesome. If you don't do well enough, we will send you an Ask Me Another Rubik's Cube. <laughs> so remember, the stakes are high. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, here you go. Selena, Gary, Jonah, and Amy. Uh, that's my favorite show on TV currently, Veep. Ah, it's the best, right? Absolutely. Not safe for work. No, <laughs> no, not really. Here's another one. Lillian, Titus, Jacqueline, and Kimmy. Uh, that's the unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. Are you watching that? I haven't seen the season, second season yet, no. Me neither. So excited. Well, I'm so excited. Time to catch up. I know, we have a date. Jeff, <laughs> here's your next one. Jeff, Abed, Annie, and Pierce. That's Community. Yes. Ah, you watch a lot of television, I think. Uh, unfortunately so. Okay, good. You know what? There's nothing wrong with it. Good for you. <laughs> you do what you enjoy in your spare time. Yeah, but now this is on the radio, people are going to know. <laughs> yeah, people are going to listen to the radio, and they're going to be like, that guy Adam watches TV. <laughs> that guy in the radio watches television. What a sellout. <laughs> Here's another one for you. James, Cat, Kara, and Wynn. Oh, no. Aha. Uh -huh. Just when you got all confident, <laughs> huh? Would you, would you like a little hint? I would love one. It is one of about 700 live-action superhero shows on right now. But this one mentions the hero's gender in the title. Oh, uh, is it Supergirl? It is Supergirl. Well mm -hmm. done. Oh, yeah. Mora, Josh, Shelley, and Allie. Well, this one's not ringing any bells, unfortunately, either. All right. How about a hint? I would love one. It's a family drama starring mm, Jeffrey Tambor. Oh, Transparent. That's right. Michaela? One I, need to catch up on. I haven't seen it either. They say it's good. But sometimes, don't you just, you know, 17 seasons later in a show that everyone's watching, don't you just go, you know what, there'll be another one. <laughs> I'm just going to let it go. <laughs> it's true. I tend to resist if a show if a show is really beloved and everybody talks about how great it is, I yeah. tend to resist watching Me it. Me too. I don't know I'm like, why. oh, that's what you're, everyone's into? Yeah. Well, then I definitely will not be into that. <laughs> that's right. We will never have shared conversation. Good luck. <laughs> Here's one. Michaela, Wes, Connor, and Annalise. Oh boy, I, I was on a roll at the beginning, but I, I need another hint, I'm afraid. We're getting a little a little, a little harder. Um, this is uh, produced by Shonda Rhimes. Uh, Scandal? Is that a Shonda Rhimes? That is a Shonda Rhimes, but another one. Mm. Um, I wish I knew more Shonda Rhimes at this moment. Uh, this one, yeah. uh, Viola Davis? No? Um, no. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you what it is. It's How to Get Away with Murder. <laughs> oh, too bad. <laughs> yeah, I guess you don't watch that one. No. I do. <laughs> and let me tell you, it is like a delicious piece of candy that is not good for you. Yeah, that's a good kind of television. <laughs> All right. It's getting harder. Dev, Arnold, Rachel, and Denise. Dev was the first name? Dev. D-E-V. Dev. That sounds so familiar. Uh, I would love a hint. Uh, it's Aziz Ansari's comedy. Oh, uh, Master of None. That is correct. Yes. Well done. This is your last clue. Glenn, Daryl, Carl, and Rick. That is The Walking Dead. It certainly is. <laughs> you are right. That is amazing. You did fantastic. We, as promised, are going to send you an Ask Me Another Rubik's Cube. Thank you so much for playing and talking with us, Adam. Oh, thank you so much. Have a nice day. You too. <laughs> Seven. 
Now, critics say we're in the golden age of television, but I don't know. I think pretty fondly of the 80s. The 80s graced us with some classics like Hill Street Blues, Full House, The A-Team. Do you have a uh, favorite 80s television show, Jonathan Colton? Favorite 80s show. Yep. Uh, they were all so good. It was the perfect era for formulaic television. It was. It was so good. If you were a kid, you knew what was going to happen on every show. D- you know, Dukes of Hazard. I was a big Dukes oh. of Hazard fan. Me too. Those Duke brothers always got into a lot of trouble. And I just love the uh, the little VO every time they like jumped off a cliff and they had to go to commercial. <laughs> Cliffhanger before every commercial? Are you <laughs> kidding me? Awesome. Fantastic. I liked A Different World. That, that's like, <laughs> that was so playing yeah, to exactly sure. who I wanted to be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But there was clunkers. Lots of clunkers. There were some clunkers. I think my favorites were ultimately kind of clunkers. Probably. There was one called uh, She's the Sheriff. It was starring Suzanne Summers because clearly they were like, Suzanne Summers will sell any project. That's right. So she was a young widow who takes over her deceased husband's job as a sheriff in a Nevada town. What could go wrong? I bet hilarity ensued. Oh, I'm pretty sure there was cliffhangers. Yeah. In this next game called The Tin Age of Television, contestants Mary Kana and Jason Hall travel back to the 80s to revisit some of those forgotten gems. Totally tubular is the thing that kids used to say in the (laughs) 80s. That rolled off your tongue. (laughs) (laughs) Just so you know, this game was taped at Central Park Summer Stage with puzzle guru Art Chung. The 80s had a lot of high-concept television shows, like A Car That Talks, or An Alien Who Eats Cats, or Miami Cops Who Fight Crime Without Wearing Ties or Socks. I know, how did they do it? In this game, we're going to read you short descriptions of 80s TV shows, and you have to tell us if these were actual shows or shows we made up. And there's no need to buzz in because we will just alternate between the two of you. Okay, so let's start with you, Mary. Manimal. Handsome, wealthy Dr. Jonathan Chase fights crime using his superpower. He can shapeshift into any animal he chooses. And because special effects in the 80s sucked, any animal meant a hawk or a panther. It was a show. You're saying that was a real show? Yeah. Yes, it was. <laughs> Mr. Smith, an experimental potion gives Cha-Cha the orangutan the ability to talk and an IQ of 256. So naturally, he goes to Washington, D.C. to become a political advisor, which is a weird and complete waste of such a high IQ, but <laughs> there you go. Uh, that sounds pretty fake. I'm going to say that's fake. It does sound fake, but it is real. I'm sorry. I know. It's a real show. I know. The, the chimp's name's Cha-Cha. It has a super high Q, and it changes its name to Mr. Smith. Doesn't seem possible, right? It seems insane. Why would you drop Cha-Cha? <laughs> right. Yes. right. You were born with Cha-Cha. Yeah. I married Dora, Mary. Single dad, Peter Farrell, depends on his housekeeper, Dora, who's in the country illegally, to keep his family together. When she's about to be deported, he does the only thing he can do. He marries her. Not a show. Oh, oh, that was a show. That was a show. Illegals were hilarious in the 80s. Jason, this is for you. Fish out of water. Lawrence Fish is a high-powered attorney in Malibu with a cigarette boat who gets disbarred after sleeping with his client's wife. Disgraced, he is forced to move to his hometown of Omaha where he takes over his family's furniture business. I'm going to say that's real. I think that sounds real. It uh, does not sound real, and it is fake. (laughs) I'm sorry. Mary, home before dinner. Stay-at-home dad Charlie Sanders invents a time machine from spare parts in his garage. When Freckles, the family dog, activates it by accident, Charlie and his twin girls Holly and Jamie go on the adventure of several lifetimes. Featuring Don Rickles as the insulting voice of Freckles the Dog. That was a show. That's not a show. (laughs) That's fake. I'm sorry. That was fake. We made that one up, but I love that you wanted it to be a show. Don Rickles, man. Don Rickles as a dog. Just insulting everyone. Don Rickles. Yeah. Everyone loves Don Rickles. All right, Jason. Mr. Merlin. If King Arthur's trusted wizard were alive today, where would he be? According to this sitcom... He's an auto mechanic in San Francisco, saddled with a bumbling apprentice named Zack. Can Merlin teach Zack to use his magic wisely? The apprentice's name is Zack? That's right, (laughs) Zack. Totally fake. Oh, I'm sorry, that's a real show. (laughs) 
So just to be clear, in Mr. Merlin, Merlin is hiding himself by calling himself Mr. Merlin. Yeah, what's that? They're like, are you the wizard? He's like, no, no. No, no, no. I am Mr. Merlin. <laughs> Mary, the B team, a spin off of the A team, most notable for the absence of its stars, Mr. T and George Papard. Remaining team members, Face and Murdoch, run a detective agency out of an alligator farm in Tallahassee. Yes, that was a show. I'm sorry, that was not a show. Come on. Okay, Jason, this is for you. Automan, that is short for the automatic man. Automan is an artificial intelligence program that can create a hologram of itself and fight crime. <laughs> oh, let me finish. Automan's best buddy is Cursor, a floating polyhedron that can create objects out of light, like, for instance, the autocopter, the autoplane, and the redundantly named autocar. Is that real or fake, Jason? Like uh, I'm going to say that's fake. It is real. It is a real show. <laughs> I cannot believe what has happened. Amazing. Well, Mary won that game. If you can call answering one clue correct, winning, which I guess in this case we're going to. <laughs> Listen, it's public radio. We want everybody to be happy. Everybody's a winner on public radio. Now it's time to turn off the tube and get back to work. In this final round, led by puzzle guru Art Chung, we ask, who's the boss? And just like when they switched the actress who played Becky on Roseanne, these are different contestants than the ones that you've heard throughout the episode. So... Good luck following. Now we're going to crown this week's grand champion. Let's bring back Tony, Justin, Jennifer, Ben, and Chris to play our Ask Me One More final round. Our puzzle guru, Art Chung, will lead this final round called Who's the Boss? In Tony Danza's classic sitcom, Who's the Boss? It wasn't always clear whether Tony or Angela was in charge. But in this round, I'll give you some fictional employees and you have to tell me the boss best associated with those characters. So if I said Homer Simpson, the answer would be Montgomery Burns. We're playing the spelling bee style, so one wrong answer and you're out. You only have a few seconds to give me that answer, and the last person standing is our Ask Me Another grand winner. Here we go. Tony, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Santa? Yep, Santa's his boss. Good job. <laughs> Justin, Communications Officer Uhura and Science Officer Spock. Captain James T. Kirk. That's right. <laughs> Jennifer. Sir Lancelot. King Arthur. You got it. Ben. The Oompa Loompas. Uh, Willy Wonka. Mm hmm. That's right. And Chris. C.J. Craig. President Bartlett. That's right, from the West Wing. Back to Tony. James Bond. Uh, Q. No, I'm sorry, that's incorrect. Justin? M. M is the right letter. Sorry, thank you, Tony. <laughs> Jennifer? Liz Lemon. Jack Donaghy. That's right. <laughs> ben, Mr. Carson and Mr. Bates. I don't know. Oh, all right, step aside. Chris? Uh, I don't know. I don't, you don't know. know. All right, no. step aside. Let's see if Justin knows. The Earl of Grantham. <laughs> That's right, Lord Grantham. Chris and Ben, you're out. We're quickly down to two players, Jennifer and Justin. I can't, I can't decide if that or James T. Kirk was nerdier. I don't know which... <laughs> On the fence. The cadence was perfect. Because <laughs> yeah. I had a little like, I know this, and shame on you for not knowing it. <laughs> All right, Jennifer. Carla Tortelli and Diane Chambers. Sam Malone. You got it. <laughs> Justin. Shakespeare's Iago. Othello? That's right. I'm really glad you got that one, Justin, because Jennifer, Disney's Iago. (laughs) 
Oh my God. I can see him. I'm going to have to call three seconds. All right, Justin, if you know the answer, you'll be our grand prize winner. Mickey Mouse? <laughs> that was close. The answer was Jafar from Aladdin. So, Jennifer, you're still in the game. Jennifer, Christopher Moltisanti and Silvio Dante. These characters ring a bell. You're giving me a look. No, I'm sorry. All right, Justin, if you know the answer, you're a winner. Tony Soprano. That's right. That's our show. Thank you so much for listening. Check out our podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. And you can find us on Facebook or Twitter at NPR Ask Me Another. Check out our bonus games and audio clips. And you should come see us live or even be a contestant. Go to amatickets.org. Ask Me Another's house musician is Jonathan Colton. Hey, his name anagrams to Val Jolta Cannon. Our senior supervising producer is Art Chung. Narc Thug. With additional puzzle writing by Eric Feinstein, Lena Mazitzis, and senior writers Karen Lurie and Kyle Beakley. Ask Me Another's produced by Kiana Fitzgerald. Giant Fake Lizard. Mike Ketziff. Me Tika Fez. Travis Larchuk. Sick Heart Larva. Julia Melfi. I'm Jailview. Denny Shin. And his ins. And our intern, Alejandra Vasquez. That's me, Real Zen Java Squad. Along with Anya Grunman. A damn angry nun. We'd like to thank our production partner, WNYC. CYNW. I'm her ripe begonias. Ophira Eisenberg. And this was Ask Me Another from NPR. Hey, it's Ophira Eisenberg here. Now, I know if you made it to this point in the podcast, you are a fan of our show. Thank you so much. So... Why don't you do us a favor and rate us on iTunes? Or better yet, leave us a review. Your support helps other people find our podcast. Thank you. Next time on Ask Me Another, we talk to comedian Wyatt Sinek about his fondness for puppets and other whimsical personality traits. Have you seen this hair? This is whimsy. This is a cotton candy machine that broke. Join me, Ophira Eisenberg, on NPR's Hour of Puzzles, Word Games, and Trivia.